everyone. Uh, my name is Crean Butler, and I'm the director of the Global Economy and Finance Programme at Chatham House. It is my great pleasure today to host a discussion with Dr. Jesus Seada Kuri, who is a candidate for the position of Director General uh, of the WTO. And this is the second in a series of such discussions that Chatham House is hosting with the WTO uh, candidates. And I'm very pleased that this forms part of Chatham House's centenary celebrations. In its first 100 years, the Institute has been a strong and committed supporter of the rules-based international system. And we hope these discussions on the future leadership of the WTO can contribute in a small way to strengthening a critical part of that system. Dr. Seada has had an enormously distinguished career in international economic policy. He has led a number of critical trade negotiations, but also has experience in the IFIs and in academia. He was Mexico's ambassador to the GATT in the early 1990s, and then served as deputy director general, both in the GATT and in success organization, the WTO, at a critical stage in both the conclusion of the Uruguay round and then in the starting phase of its implementation. He is currently Under Secretary for North America in the Mexican uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs and has been the lead negotiator for Mexico on the US-Mexico-Canada trade agreement. He has also served as a senior advisor in the IMF, working on debt relief in particular. And alongside his work in the official sector, he has been a senior academic working in Hong Kong, Shenzhen and Warwick University in the UK. Uh, before we begin our discussion, I'd just like to make a few quick housekeeping points. Uh, this webinar is on the record uh, and is being recorded. If you wish to tweet, please use the hashtag CHEvents. And after an initial discussion of 20 minutes or so, we will move to a Q&A segment uh, where uh, my aim will be to um, ask people to put their questions if we have the time available. Alternatively, I will look at the questions as they come in and uh, ask them myself. And if you would like to ask a question, please submit it through the Q&A function on the Zoom platform, not the chat function or uh, by raising your hand. Now, uh, I'd be very grateful if everybody could uh, keep their questions and comments as brief as possible, uh, because we have a relatively short time of 45 minutes and we have a hard stop at um, 1700 hours uh, UK time. Uh, Dr. Saadia, thank you so much for sparing the time uh, for being with us today. Um, perhaps I could start the discussion by asking you about your overarching philosophy on global trade. And it's very clear from the statement that you made to the WTO Council and in your press conference that you know the world trade system from the inside out. Um, and you're very focused on bringing everyone together to find solutions to current challenges. But um, behind all of that, there is a you know, key, key philosophy about what is this whole effort for? What is our goal? Uh, is it free trade, fair trade, greater global growth? Um, and given that view of what the goal is, how does it influence your vision for the future of the WCO? Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Creon. I'm really honored and delighted to be with you. I've had uh, extensive interactions with Chatham House in the past in several ways. I will not go through that, but uh, it's, it's an honor to be invited to talk to you on your centenary, uh, uh, your anniversary. And um, let me also say that I have a deep attachment, and that, that's not just words, it relates to the question. I have a deep, deep attachment to the UK. Uh, that's where I studied. Uh, I was extremely uh, kind of given, delivered to my life as, a, as an academic in the UK. I taught for a number of years very successfully. I was doing very well. Um, and all that really, I created a family in the UK. So all that really imprinted in me very much of your outlook on life. The UK, and if I may say the European although those two are not necessarily kosher to say together. For me, they are. Uh, the European way of looking at the world, which is very much an open society, and in particular, an open economy, but also a rules-based economy, a rules-based society, where, for example, there is a clear role 
for the government. It's not just the Adam Smith extreme of uh, free for all, but a rules-based uh, system. And uh, I, I'm very much a believer. So coming to your question, my philosophy about the system that I would like to help create, I'll give you two complementary answers, two halves. The first one is mostly backward looking. The second is mostly forward looking. The former is that we need to reinstate a strong rules-based, dynamic, and inclusive system. All three parts of that statement are in serious peril, <laughs> each one, okay? The rules-based, we know, the dynamic, we have stopped negotiation, and the inclusive, uh, uh, well, let me just very briefly say, all the attention historically has been mostly on using the language of Wimbledon, I would call center court procedures. The negotiations between European Union and the Americas, now the UK and China and India, the main negotiations. Of course, those have to be done and dealt with and move forward. But we cannot leave out special areas of particular interest that are not captured, are not addressed by these center court processes. For example, when we completed the negotiations creating the, the World Trade Organization, after everybody had have, have been to all the celebrations, after Marrakesh, signature and everything else, the least developed countries, that's a category of 49 countries, according to United Nations, which are the poorest countries in the world, began to say, hey, we cannot uh, undertake all those commitments. And the response was, what are you talking about? This has been done and completed and agreed. But of course, they had not been part of it to sufficient extent. And to cut it short, uh, I, as Deputy Director General, responsible for development as well as for international relations, uh, lobbied, discussed with the big trade powers. And we agreed, they agreed, they accepted to reopen the negotiations, which was very painful and very risky. We reopened the negotiations and we had a successful stint of about four months that I chaired to develop special provisions for them. So that can't happen again. Inclusive has to mean that you look at the interests and the needs of the least developed countries, the interests and the needs of the small vulnerable economies, which are a very special kettle of fish, the small, the, the needs of, uh, of landlocked countries uh, and so on and so forth. So uh, that is a, a primary theme that I really would like to, to help countries recreate this rules-based dynamic and inclusive system. But at the same time, this doesn't tell us enough about where we're going, about the future. It only lays the, the, the groundwork and it's very important, it's vital. But in terms of where we're going, I find that the world has continued to change. and We cannot make do with what we have had in the past, even if we do it very well now. In particular, I think of issues like, uh, how can you develop and have satisfactory rules on trade without having enough on investment, which is increasingly part and parcel of the trade equation. And then all the tension in the world falls on anti-dumping and subsidies. But what about developing a stronger provisions that we begin to have on competition, competition policy, as you have very strongly in any given country. In a country, you have a ministry doing trade and somebody doing investments, somebody doing competition. And also, you have somebody doing finance. In this world, we do have finance uh, done, taken care of by the International Monetary Fund, by the World Bank, by the regional banks, but the connection with trade doesn't exist. In your country, it, the connection is done in something called the cabinet. You have the ministries, but you have the cabinet and you have the boss on top in case of need. Internationally, we don't have that. So the only way to do it is to develop what I call a new multilateralism that begins to be more comprehensive, not only in the sense of being inclusive, but thematically begins to develop uh, a vision on investment, on competition, and on the 
immensely important connection between trade and finance. So that's what I would leave it uh, as the answer to this one. Well, thank you very much. You immediately raised some absolutely fascinating questions. I mean, if I could just follow from your, your last point, of course, in some ways, the G20 is meant to be the place where yeah. you bring all the different elements together. And indeed, you know, from, from 2010 onwards, there was a kind of framework for strong, sustainable and balanced growth, which was meant to have all the different elements. You have all the international organizations, political leadership and so on. Um, so there is, so there's a need to do that, but, but at the same time, um, you know, and also actually in the past, as you, you'll know extremely well, the WTO did, con there were those in, in Europe and who wanted the WTO to go into investment competition and so on. And it was more than the system could bear basically at the time, I think would be a way of looking at it. So, so I think your aspiration is, is absolute, you know, makes a great deal of sense. But there is a practical problem that the institution is is struggling as it is now, even with the issues that are clearly within its reach. So the question is, you know, how how do one how does one sequence this effort? Um, and you know, for example, one could use the example of of the approach to the the, the crisis at the moment in the dispute settlement area or the lack of negotiations. How does one sequence? tackling those problems versus this need for a broader approach? Uh, of course, I, I was uh, giving you my vision, my long-term vision. And I said the second part yeah, was the that, long-term vision. That's absolutely fair, yeah. One would hope to begin to go in a certain direction, but uh, the priority uh, on an immediate basis is the first part of what I said, repairing the vessel and uh, giving it the due dynamics and the inclusiveness. That's absolutely central. What we need to do is to start with the first steps. And the first steps, as I said in my presentation to, to, to the authorities of trade in, uh, at, the, uh, at the WTO, is to, uh, first of all, to deal with negotiations. We have had preciously little negotiations of, of enough significance since the creation of WTO, 26 years. We've had some important, but very narrow, on trade facilitation, on on uh, banning uh, export subsidies in agriculture, but they're very narrow, important. But uh, by and large, the negotiation machine has uh, essentially stopped. We need to restart it. That's not something you do like, you, like when you switch the lights on. That's not something you can do that way. It's more like regaining momentum by a person on the track. Uh, you have to take a first step then two in the same time as the first, and then five, and then you're running and you're moving in a satisfactory way. So what we need is to press on with the negotiations now on the way, and I hope to contribute to pressing on. There's been continuing uh, grandstanding on the negotiations on the way on fisheries. We have to complete those uh, very quickly within the time expected, which is end of the year. Uh, there are other negotiations being done not multi multilaterally, but plurilaterally, so a group of countries, but it's not a dozen countries, it's 50 and 90, so very massive negotiations uh, that are very much supportive of, as long as they are open and, uh, and have a kind of multilateral spirit to them. Uh, and we have those on the way on uh, facilitation of investment, on rule, uh, on regulation domestically in relation to services, on electronic trade, that uh, the COVID uh, has shown us how vital it is. It's central to the future, and it doesn't exist in the in the agreements in the WTO. So I want to continue contribute to to moving forward as well as we can with those, so that we can in parallel begin to discuss what negotiations we can launch uh, next year. We have the big ministerial in June, in principle, in June 2021. The, the ministerial conference of the WTO that should happen every two years. And this one is coming after four years. So that creates additional pent up pressure for achievement. So at that ministerial, we have to do well. And that includes launching new negotiations that have to include agriculture because agriculture was never seen as an on off achievement 26 years ago. It was a process that was started that has a mandate built in to continue and it didn't. 
So the countries that have a, an export interest have every right to say, hey, where is this? So let's move on with agriculture, definitely. I hope that we can begin to respond to the claim by everybody in high street and in every street in our countries uh, for protecting better than the environment. By high street, I mean the common people, not the trade uh, specialists, uh, to respond to the environment. environment. Environment and trade is a very tricky area. Uh, I will be very careful on what I would uh, try to invite countries to address. Uh, issues that, uh, that can quickly fall into protectionism are better say for, I don't know, later, if at all. But there's a lot that can be done, I'm sure, that is win-win uh, or win-win-win-win-win 164 times uh, for, for the membership. I believe that we need to engage in uh, global warming uh, and, uh, and production and trade uh, to, to, to look for opportunities for, for gain. So that is the negotiation machinery that I want to see moving from the first step in fisheries to the launching of important negotiations and other things, transparency and other things to, to come on board uh, next year. Then in parallel, we have the, the, the dispute settlement system, the appellate body that is fundamental. That was when we created WTO, the crowning jewel. Uh, and uh, it is now in complete disrepair. Uh, I, I, I am amazed that it is in, in disrepair because I have read every single statement by the United States, which is a country most dramatically complaining about the state of things. And uh, the claims they make a, are in many cases accepted by everybody else, including the European Union, which is the main counterpart on this. But they accept that many of the things that the US, United States claims are true, uh, excessive behavior, I mean, uh, behavior by the appellate body outside the, the limits set by the agreements. But at the same time, I find that nothing any of them says amounts to changing a comma in the agreements. So it should be doable to find a solution. And what is missing is a connection between the appellate body that is autonomous, but it's autonomous, but it's not free to go wherever it wants. It's autonomous in handling individual cases, but it has a supervisor. The supervisor is called dispute settlement body, which is all the countries, all the ambassadors. The problem is that we never designed that connection between the supervisor and the supervisee. And I believe that's not too difficult to design. Uh, I have my ideas, uh, we can come back to that, but it's basically a question of institutional engineering on that issue. And then thirdly, I would work very hard on uh, reinvigorating the institution as an institution to make the committees and the councils more responsive. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense uh, it doesn't make sense if uh, a country says, hey, I have this, uh, this uh, budding problem with the European Union or with uh, England or with whoever, uh, uh, saying that this particular product doesn't comply with this and that. I need an assessment by the committee. Yes, ambassador, no problem. The next meeting of the committee is in December. That's not good enough. My producers cannot wait until December. But I see no reason why we shouldn't be able to handle certain decisions by circulation, which I used to do in a beautifully efficient way in the International Monetary Fund, or by video conferencing, as we're doing now. So maybe we, we, we can say, OK, there'll be a special meeting on your issue two weeks from now at noon. So I hope to, to, to bring more efficiency, perhaps to work with the members to shorten the length uh, spent on dispute resolution, which is too long. In the US-Mexico-Canada agreement which was finished, one thing that filled me with pride was that at Mexico's proposal, at my proposal, we got by one whole year the duration of a typical panel, from two and a half years to one and a half years in that context. So we can do things of that kind. Those are my three tracks, negotiations, appellate body, and efficiency in different senses. Thank you very much. I mean, it's fascinating. There's a kind of, it's like you envisage a new normal for trade negotiations in, in the future, um, using technology, I, I guess, in a way. 
Um, and it, it also struck me when you were talking about the relationship between the uh, the dispute settlement body and the um, and the 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 appellate the appellate uh, body itself. I mean, there are similarities when the UK first introduced operational autonomy for the central bank. There was a very real question about how you relate uh, the role of parliament in setting the mandate on the one hand to the independence of the institution itself. And it seems that there may be in a number of areas things that you could draw on in strengthening that element if that indeed proves a solution. But perhaps I, I could um, perhaps I can come to, to uh, one point that you've made in a number of uh, the, the public appearances, which is about the experience you had uh, in the 1990s around the conclusion of the Uruguay round, when in a, in a way there were also a great many challenges, but also different strands and so on. And the key, uh, it seemed to be, was to kind of create a political momentum and consensus to move forward. And from what you've said, this is a similar kind of challenging point, I guess, in a way. And I just wonder, is there anything you would draw from that experience of how the Uruguay round was concluded in, in terms of specifically getting this political momentum and consensus to move forward uh, today, either things that you would do or things that you wouldn't do having had that experience? Sure. Well, I find it uh, very, uh, very noticeable that at that time there was a tremendous amount of interest by the private sector. There was not one week where, when I or any ambassador uh, of any kind of uh, uh, medium, influ partial influential uh, country delegation would not be visited by uh, business people from Europe, from the UK, from America, from Asia. There was a, a very heavy involvement and also by the political bodies. Uh, 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 Euro parliamentarians came to my office many times. I talk to the people handling all these issues now or in the last several years during the Doha round period. And there was not one soul to be seen beyond the actual negotiators. Uh, so this favorable wind has disappeared. Uh, I don't think you can do a lot to recreate it on an immediate basis because we need pretty much immediate results now to address the problems to, to, to begin to move forward. So we need to move forward in the absence of these favorable winds using the flip side of the favorable winds, which is the scare that it has to create in your soul and mind, the fact that we are close to the edge, we're close to the brink, uh, in the sense that uh, there has already been a legal initiative in the United States to pull out of the WTO, and uh, it didn't go anywhere, but you cannot exclude the possibility that things could get even worse and things are already very bad. So I think on the basis of the very negative situation we have with enough, uh, uh, enough of, a, of an awareness of that situation, we can take the first steps forward out of the hole. But at the same time, we definitely have to start building those helpful constituencies to help us. Again, I mentioned the agreement that I just uh, managed to complete with Ambassador Lighthizer in the United States and with uh, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland in Canada. Uh, it was really extremely challenging for much of the time. It was being denounced by the whole of the uh, opposition party. It was basically a political football. Everybody said this was uh, uh, not necessarily the most important priority, but we began to work in earnest with the private sector in the United States, the private sector in my country responded beautifully. We had a huge support, a, a very well-built structure, infrastructure, architecture of, uh, of uh, uh, a whole private sector team uh, to address issues of intellectual property or agriculture or rules. In each area, you had a whole team and the legal counsel for that team and so on and so forth. We uh, work with the American private sector and uh, it didn't take us all that much effort to have them incentivated into taking the same kind of approach with enormous uh, vigor. So for the closing of that treaty, we had uh, in the United States, a private sector support uh, network 
that included more than 300 business associations, not businesses, but business associations working together. I really think that we need to give more attention to in the WTO to links with the private sector, to, 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 to the public eye, to, uh, to arousing interest and arousing support from the public at large. I think that's as important as any of the one uh, of the several areas in negotiation. The public interest that's to be awakened by the countries themselves. Thank you very much. Um, and now what I'd like to do is invite everybody to uh, put in their questions through the Q and A um, uh, function on the on the Zoom platform, and um, we will kind of continue the discussion as the questions come in. I will try and. Um, uh, um, choose between a great many. Actually, already a number have come in. Um, perhaps, uh, perhaps I could go first of all to to John Mason, who has a question. I think it's a question specifically framed in terms of uh, animal welfare, but I think there's a broader issue about biodiversity and its relationship with trade. So perhaps we'd ask John if you'd like to put your question, please. Just take a minute or two to unmute him. John, would you like to put your yes. question? Thank you very much. Um, so my question is, can, can I ask a question regarding, will it be possible for all nations to protect animal welfare where future trade and trade deals are concerned? Uh, when we try to safeguard the environment and carbon, will it be also possible to safeguard the animal's welfare within that, that concern about the biosphere as mentioned, especially where different standards exist? And finally, can animal welfare standards be leveled up um, rather than leveled down in future trade deals, um, which would be obviously Britain is a country which, uh, and I'm sure other countries are also equally concerned on this issue. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, John. So it's, I think it's, well, um, Ambassador, over to you. <laughs> it's a, it's a, an obviously an important question to a great many people looking at the world trade system. Well, it is certainly very important. Um, uh, he's making a distinction, which is very valid between animal welfare and the environment. But the environment also is not uh, remotely sufficiently uh, looked after in trade agreements in the WTO or in trade agreements generally. Uh, I don't mean to conflate the two, but the two are very important priorities with some points of contact, some similarities. And the reality is that uh, in all these issues, of course, we have to continue to push for cooperation. That's what, that's one answer. Cooperation. We have agencies that work on this. We have lots of uh, NGOs that work on this. We have to support them. Our governments have to support it. I'm not trying to shirk the issue by saying all this. All this is necessary. It's very important. At the same time, I find it uh, almost unconscionable that, uh, that the World Trade Organization should have basically nothing to say about these issues. It has not been possible to uh, bring questions of the environment and the broader environment, as you describe it, into our work. Um, one reason is that the environment can very easily be used and abused for protectionist reasons. Uh, it is very easy to say, ah, oh, you are not doing what you should be doing when the real aim of my initiative is to protect my producers. And that conflict between protectionism or fair trade or free trade and the environment has made us essentially freeze and not do anything. I really very much think the time has come when we cannot continue to ignore the environment uh, uh, completely in the WTO. We need to take it up. What we need to do is to identify areas, issues, where it is possible to agree on to negotiate. But the negotiations would be not so much the creation of potential to stop your trade, because I say that you are not doing enough, but more uh, uh, creating space policy space for positive incentives for governments to do the right thing. 
for governments to reward protection of the environment, for governments to reward animal welfare. So I, I believe that the time has come for cooperation. This is not something where we have anything going and the WTO is a member driven organization. So I could tell you anything and it doesn't count for anything unless the countries agree to go in this direction. But in my sense, we have to start going in, the, in this direction on a cooperative win-win basis. Thank you. I mean, it, I think it highlights a, a, a broader issue, which is where, um, in a way, for, for, for the overall system to work, you not only need the things that are negotiated in the WTO, but you also need the appropriate national policies to go alongside that. So whether that's in this case of labor standards or the protecting the environment or whatever. And uh, so my question really is, how do you think from a WTO point of view, you can handle this? Because you know, if you try and draw everything into the WTO, the, the negotiation will fail. But at the same time, if, if countries don't complement uh, the outcomes of WTO negotiations, it will also fail. So what, what is the solution to that, um, that challenge? I think you're right. And I remind you in my introduction, I said that my mentality of how the world should function well beyond the WTO is that uh, we need open societies, socially open, economically open, free market, but at the same time with governments that have a clear role, with regulations that look for the good of all. So there are lots of things that governments should be doing. There are lots of things that governments didn't do in the 1990s and 2000s that were decades of excessive fascination with the free market. I am a free marketer myself. I believe in the free market. I, 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 I would fight uh, in the defense of uh, open trade. But uh, I recognize that when you have open trade, for example, you can have uh, changes in the profile, the production profile of countries where some industries in your country begin to go down. And it is fine as long as other industries be begin to go up. But it is not quite fine unless you internally help people in the, in the sunset industries redesign themselves, re-education or whatever, redeployment. And, and, and incentives to begin to expand in the industries, high technology, whatever it may be, where your country is in a more promising upswing. Well, the same applies to issues on the environment, to issues on animal welfare, to issues, for example, uh, it is absolutely not surprising that the bulk of the benefits of globalization have gone to big firms, okay? It's not surprising because technology is making transportation cheaper, technology is making information more universal. So you can be sitting in, 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 in Argentina or in South Africa, and you, you know perfectly well what the Koreans can consume and at what price. And you feel envy that they can get something cheaper and, 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 and good quality. So you begin to demand across the world. So the world begins to be a small place. And that makes it possible for the biggest firms to conquer the world. So that gives you the basis for the, for the expansion of, of economic giants like Siemens or like General Motors or, 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 or Toyota or whatever it may be. Well, and pharmaceuticals, of course, many in, in your country. Well, one problem there is that we have left the invisible hand to do all the work for the society. But there can also be assistance by the government, assisting small and medium enterprises. And that has been a common cry from, from Manhattan to London, to Mexico, to, to Hong Kong, to everywhere. And so we need to develop policy space again, the term that I used before in relation to the environment, we need to develop policy space. That means agreeing that certain measures are not offensive, to the contrary, are encouraged to help, for example, in the example I'm giving you, uh, small and medium enterprises, to help them gain, gain scale, to help them do their financial borrowing collectively. So you might have some kind of intervention by government to enable syndicated borrowing by, by uh, 50 small firms in a given sector who are going to pay much lower interest thanks to that. Or procurement, they can buy in bulk 
and pay cheaper or creating a brand. So you can do lots of things by having governments take a more proactive stance in supporting society in combination with international agreements. Not everything has to fall on the back of international agreements. As Creon says, that's very correct. But in any case, even international agreements have to start taking on board issues concerning the environment and animal, animal welfare by all means. Thank you very much. Actually, that's a very good link to another question that we have from uh, Ignacio uh, Garcia Becerra. Uh, if we could, uh, Becerra, Ignacio Garcia Becerra, if we could open up um, and unmute Ignacio, please. Ignacio, would you like to put your question? Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah. Yes, hello, Ambassador. The, as you know, one of the more the difficult uh, topics uh, is the issue of industrial subsidies, where the United States, Japan, and the European Union have been uh, putting forward uh, proposals uh, to strengthen the rules of the WTO on industrial subsidies. But uh, China, through its WTO ambassador, has indicated that they are clearly opposed to such negotiations. What can the director general do in those circumstances? How it can help uh, to break uh, the impasse? Well, there are many difficulties that the WTO faces now. The appellate body and the definition of who, what flexibilities developing countries have, and agricultural subsidies, lots of very serious difficulties. But by far, you have touched on perhaps the most serious one, because it goes directly to the very dire conflict that we face between the United States and the, and, and the West and China. Uh, the West says China has not con continued to evolve towards the market economy. Uh, the convergence they were having is nowhere to be seen. And China says there's, there was no commitment on, on such co convergence. Uh, we have accepted the commitments that uh, were negotiated, and now you want me to, to negotiate something else? That's difficult. Uh, whatever can be achieved between the United States and China, it'll be for China and the United States to define. And uh, all I can do is to provide my best offices, a forceful intermediation, a helpful, a helpful intermediator to find a way to move forward. Uh, for starter, one area that I think can be considered as helpful in this kind of area related to this is, uh, is transparency, for example, not only in relation to industrial policies or subsidies, but also in relation to trade policies. That's very much a demand that Japan has separately uh, made, placed on the table, in enhanced transparency. And there are transparency on investment policies that could be of interest to other countries. So I believe that transparency is a powerful agenda that could be embarked on, that could touch on some of these issues and could help the countries concerned to, be, to begin to find a way to move forward. But, uh, but otherwise, it is really for the United States and Europe to formulate what exactly, and, and Japan in this case, uh, what exactly they want to to discuss with China and for China to accept the process of moving forward. Uh, uh, they're, they're not going to accept whatever comes to them as is. Uh, it may be that they need other things on the table to be handled at the same time. So we will have to see. That's a very, very tricky issue. Ignacio, you are clearly uh, a well-informed participant in all this. That is the key issue. And I certainly want to help countries find a way to make progress to the satisfaction of everybody. Thank you very much. Um, an, another very tricky area, which uh, could well become more tricky in the future, is the whole question of, and you've touched on it to some extent, but the interaction between the needs to um, uh, accelerate action on climate change on the one hand, and everything that follows from that in terms of carbon taxes and net zero commitments and so on, and how that interacts with the world trade system on, on the other hand and the rules of trade. And obviously you will, you will have observed in the, in the EU, for example, the discussion around uh, border carbon adjustment mechanisms as being really the only way to kind of square the circle in a way between 
what the EU needs to do internally and its, you know, its relationship with other countries who may not have the same commitments. Um, so how do you have a kind of view as to how you how this should be handled? Is it something that I mean, it's not crystallized yet, but it looks like it will be a major issue in the next two or three years. Do you have a view as to how to handle that? Yeah. Should we try and get ahead of the game or wait until it hits us and then tackle it at that stage? Well, a, a, a bit of both. Negotiations are between the countries. I'm not going to start negotiations in even less uh, difficult negotiation areas that have not come our way. We have enough on our plate. But nevertheless, uh, as, it, as with everything on the environment, uh, I really hope that we can make every effort to move forward in a way that does not uh, create too much room for hidden protectionism. Carbon taxes, it very much depends on how you couch them, how you frame them, how you put them together. So uh, will they apply equally to your, all your domestic consumption or do they relate to trade? That, that would be a gigantic difference. If you are applying uh, carbon taxes on everything your economy consumes, on, 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 on a national treatment basis, affecting domestic and foreign uh, supplies the same. It may be that foreign suppliers still have a grudge. Uh, it very much depends on the composition of, of trade, but that would be a very good start if it's something equitable. If it is something related to trade, it's a very different proposition. Um, at the same time, uh, carbon taxes as an economist um, I always think of taxes being positive or negative, and the effect of a of a of a price distortion in the opposite direction can be exactly the flip side of a tax, both in terms of revenue and in terms of uh, of, uh, of, uh, of 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 the incentive for the economy. So uh, it could be that your carbon taxes are exclusively punishing traders, in which case there will be much more room for people to not accept it. Or it could be that, uh, for example, you create a commitment or a rule that a country is going to utilize uh, carbon incentives, carbon price signals that will on balance be neutral. So your trade that comes in that is relatively harmful faces a certain carbon tax. And in exchange, you are bound to lower uh, trade barriers to trade that is relatively well behaved on, uh, on the carbon question. So if you do something like that, you are not creating an anti-trade bias, you are creating an anti-carbon footprint bias. So all these things would be uh, issues that I would like to understand what countries have in mind, but uh, it very much depends. But it, the risk of protectionism is absolutely clear. Sorry. No, you are. Yeah, okay. Um, it's a very, can you hear me? It's a very good example of, of uh, if one can come up with a really smart formula, uh, as indeed the WTO has in the past, I guess, that may, that may get you through a clear challenge, but you also need time to work on those approaches. Um, so Dr. Saade, very unfortunately, I'm afraid we are almost at the end of our time, um, and there are a number of questions I'm afraid I haven't uh, got to. I, I, uh, but I would like to um, come back to this, this question, and um, a colleague of mine, uh, Marianne Petzinger from Chatham House, has asked this, and a number of other people I think have referred to it as well. Um, you, you got into it to some extent in your discussion around uh, subsidies, and in particular the uh, the tension between China and the US and how this, you know, in a sense, all the good work you might do, all the good ideas you may have um, are, con are conditional on an improved kind of relationship and an improved willingness to work together from those two really important countries. Um, and, and underlying that is this whole question of special and differential treatment, which is another issue in the, in, in the tension between those two countries. So I guess the question is um, around this. I mean, it, it's, I think you, you rightly um, said that in a way, what you can do as WTO, WTO Director General is limited, but are you hopeful that this will improve and that in a sense, you will have a better environment in which to work um, 
as one looks ahead? I mean, do, do you think this is something that we could all hope for? Or do you, do you think in a way you're going to be battling against this um, if you are successful as, as uh, in your candidature for this role? No, absolutely. I have a, a basic optimism that things can begin to turn uh, we have had 26, of, 26 years of non-negotiation and the appellate body is on the floor. So let's not put everything in the basket for assessment. Relations United States-China will not improve overnight. I hope they begin to have a point of inflection on trade issues. Security issues is none of our business. It's, it doesn't pertain here on trade issues. But... Um, I believe that we can regain, re recover the path of dynamic negotiation, important, significant negotiation involving China, United States, Europe, everybody. We can do that. And I believe we can uh, resolve the issues around the appellate body. With those two in place, I believe that the chemistry uh, that prevails in the WTO will begin to change towards something more constructive. Uh, in a real negotiation, one essential ingredient is a basis of confidence, a basis of trust. If you mistrust your counterpart, you, be, you better sue them <laughs> and go through the legal, legal angles. Negotiation has to be more like creating a business together. So for me, it is vital to place myself in your shoes and to understand as much as I understand my needs, I have to understand your needs and I have to battle for them, for your needs. That's the only way to get what I need. And that doesn't exist now. So we will begin to have negotiations moving and repair the appellate body and begin to gain efficiency. I'm hopeful that we can begin to do bigger things in 2021 and 22. Well, that's a really uh, a good note on which to end. Uh... I think to, to be putting yourself forward for a role like this, optimism is one of the most uh, essential um, <laughs> qualities, and you clearly have a lot of that. Um, and masochism. Optimism and masochism. <laughs> indeed. In equal, in equal, in equal measure. In equal measure. <laughs> indeed. indeed. Um, so unfortunately, we're out of time. I'd first like to thank all our um, all our participants for joining us and for um, putting their excellent questions, but particularly uh, Dr. Seada, can I thank you for sparing this time for uh, some very insightful uh, points that you've made and for responding to the questions. And uh, I'm sure we would all like to wish you well in, in the period ahead. Uh, thank you very much. It was a great pleasure, great honor, and you are a great chairman. So thank you very much, uh, Creon. Best wishes to Chapman House and to all the audience. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Seada. Bye. Bye.